Confucian in China, bloodiest and most terrible of all. An entire civilization blown apart. There are 700 million Chinese today, one quarter of the human race, and they are taught to hate. Their growing power is the world's greatest threat to peace and life. Fifty years of torment bred madness. To deal with madness, we must understand its roots, see China's revolution through the eyes of those who were there. For seven pivotal years, author-historian Theodore White lived in China, knew the men who now control her destiny. With him, we shall look back at a century of tragedy. have been excluded from China. We can pace along this barbed wire border at Hong Kong and try to squint inside or strain out sounds, but all we hear is echo of disaster, past and present. When we ask why, there is no other book of answers but the history of this century. For both of us, Chinese and Westerners, have shared the blunders that transformed our greatest friend in Asia into our greatest enemy. Theodore H. White recalled, Those of us who lived in China in the crisis decade remember it all so differently. So close they were in friendship to us. Fingertip close. And now their fists are bald in anger. They were looking for some entry into the modern world. And nothing in their ancient culture could give them any guide to the turbulence they found. Nor could we help them. It was a quest, a 50-year search for some new kind of government, some new form of order. And in the end, they moved from tyranny to tyranny, from the tyranny of Confucius and the Manchu emperors to the tyranny of communism and Mao. And in between, we have only fitful glimpses of what happened, snatches of photography so tantalizingly incomplete to explain what happened. It all began in mystery and goes on today in mystery. For 2,000 years, we tried to read this Chinese mystery, but read it for book of myths, entrancing age-old myths brought back by travelers from beyond the mountain walls of Asia, where they had found a land of changeless wonders. A strange serenity of spirit graced its hills with beauties. Bridges arched across the rivers as much to soothe the eye as help the wayfarer. The silent shriek of violence in art might catch attention but that was echo of an anger we did not fathom. The same mythical serenity rested on all the fields of this land of peasants, a biblical rhythm carrying men from sowing to harvest, from birth to death in apparent contentment. The old myth held that China had solved the great secret of government. Confucius, half God, half sage, had taught Order and duty, these make government. Each man fixed in place, bound in obedience to those above, as those above were bound in obedience to the will of heaven. The emperor they called the son of heaven, Tianzi, because only he interpreted the will of heaven in his land. For 1,500 miles ran the Great Wall, sealing in a nation so proud it knew itself only as Zhongguo, the central kingdom, all other men barbarians. For 2,000 years behind this wall, proud China knew herself invulnerable. 
For centuries, China let barbarian Westerners dock only at Canton to buy her precious silks, her porcelain, her tea. To pay for these, Englishmen introduced opium from India. By 1830, this trade was booming. China protested, burned the opium, and the bark of English warships as war broke out in 1839 first shattered myths of Chinese power. The result, defeat, disaster. Aboard a British warship in 1842 came humiliation, with China forced by treaty to yield Hong Kong outright and open four more coastal cities to British merchants and their opium. Where Britain led, others followed. Rival powers raced each other to carve proud China as spoils. English, French, Americans, Germans, Russians demanded privileges, colonies, concessions. In 60 years had won the right to govern, try, punish Chinese in their own land. In China's capital, Peking, where from these ancient altars countless emperors had sought the mandate of heaven, the myth of heavenly rule persisted still. But deep within the palaces where China's Manchu emperors reigned, by 1900, that myth too was dead. For here ruled China's evil spirit, the Empress Dowager Zixi, a Manchu concubine, bedmate to an emperor for whom she had produced an heir. A woman with a gift of malice, said to have poisoned her own son upon his throne, installed her infant nephew as emperor, killed his mother, and then imprisoned him in 1898. An ignorant woman, but unchallenged ruler of the empire. Her court, a whispering of ladies-in-waiting and eunuch favorites. Chief among them, eunuch Li Lianying, as depraved as she. When told China needed ships to fight the foreigners, they used naval appropriations to build a marble pleasure boat in a nearby lake. Only one conviction bound her to her people, hatred of the contemptuous foreigner who tramped her land. A thousand villages deep in China mirrored her primitive hatred of the foreign devil. Moreover, their passions had found flag and leaders as a secret brotherhood, the boxers, began to flourish. Kill the white man, burn his mission, said the boxers, claiming magic charms could make their bodies impervious to Western bullets. With the Empress' consent, in early 1900, they began to kill. One of America's great novelists, then a missionary child, was at the time in China. Miss Pearl Buck recalls. The Empress Dowager had issued an edict that all white people were to be killed. And many had been killed, especially in the north in Shandong, where men, women, and children, missionaries, and business people too, had been killed. But we were so fortunate because we lived in the province of Jiangsu, and we had a very good viceroy, an intelligent man. And he knew that it was folly for the old empress to think that she could gain anything by killing the missionaries and the business people because there would be terrible retribution. And so he was so courageous as to insert a negative, a no, a not, into the imperial edict so that it read, we were not to be killed. And that's what saved our lives. Here at Peking, within these massive walls, for almost two months, 3,000 foreigners and Christian converts gathered under siege to fight for life. Their sandbagged embassies a bastion against boxer fanatics. From around the world, navies rushed troops to raise the siege. Britons, Americans, Russians, French, Germans, Japanese raced with field guns and modern rifles, whose bullets no boxer magic could resist. Victory was swift. Punishment, ruthless. North to south, foreign force patrolled the country. Japanese soldiers began to explore China's wealth and covet more. In the shadow of Peking's mighty ramparts, American soldiers tasted war on Asia's mainland for the first time and frolicked. China forever humbled.
Foreign diplomats and generals debated China's fate. This land of endless villages, crowding each other against the skyline, was it really a nation or only a geographical expression? These peasants, was their recent outburst of passion a passing madness or something deeper? Their government smashed, still they toiled as they had for centuries in the three great river valleys falling from the heights of Central Asia to shape their country. In the north, Manchuria and the valley of the Yellow River cradled one kind of Chinese for whom Peking, the Manchu capital, was their center. Here, dry northern wheat lands rolled over an unknown treasure store of minerals which Russia and Japan both sought. In the center, the valley of the mighty Yangtze with its key cities, Shanghai, Nanking, Hankou, Chongqing, where British and American power turned the wheels of industry, oiled the way of commerce. In the south, the third valley, the West River flowing by Canton to empty at Hong Kong in the sea. In the steaming Southland, peasants stooped in paddies to plant rice and spoke a dialect no Peking Chinese could even faintly comprehend. The coastal cities, where most Westerners lived, squirmed with jostling people, animal energy, humans used as beasts in street and field. Most still wore pigtails, forced on them a symbol of submission to the Manchu dynasty and its son of heaven. But within the old forbidden city, there was no government, no son of heaven. The aging Empress Dowager, her spirit broken by the Boxer War, lingered dying until 1908. And then, for all intents and purposes, the throne was empty, save for an infant of three years installed to sit in it. And then it vanished, simply vanished. The Manchu dynasty disappeared overnight. Nothing like this has ever happened in all history. 2,000 years of tradition, the whole structure of the imperial Confucian political thought dissolving to dust. The Chinese give it a name and a date. They call it Shuangshi, double ten. The date being October 10, 1911, when a riot occurred in the Yangtze Valley, which they couldn't suppress, and five weeks later, the regime had disappeared, the dynasty overthrown, never to reappear again in history. And out of this turbulence, there emerge two types of Asian leader, arch symbols, the man of guns and the man of ideas. And these two types, the gunman and the dreamer, have perplexed all our efforts in Asia for the 50 years since, and they still perplex and haunt all our policy even today. In Asian politics, gunmen rise first. General Yuan Shikai seized power at Peking, turned loose lesser generals to ransack provinces. Briefly, he gathered a puppet assembly, imported an American professor to write a constitution for a republic. But old ways were easier. Returning to Confucian order in 1915, Yuan named himself emperor, and six months later died. His rival, Sun Yat-sen, was the man of dreams. The dream of China, powerful, free of emperors and foreigners, made him from his youth a revolutionary. Students, teachers, merchants meeting in such secret headquarters joined his conspiracy. On postcards, he scrawled a rising sun, emblem of a new flag someday to be. For 20 years, he planned destruction of the Manchu tyrants to see his dreams betrayed by Yuan Shikai. But his ideas were catching fire. In 1919, students throbbing to his fiery message, sick of chaos, furious at foreign pillage, angered by Japan's demands for more of China, filled the streets with protest riots. But students had no guns. Ideas, no armies. Armies belong to warlord generals, the heirs of Yuan Shikai. Power and force were theirs. Whether trained to fight with Manchu broadsword or equipped with second-hand artillery. Laughable to Europeans, in China, such troops struck terror. Their purpose, simple. 
to rule by killing. For 15 years, a dozen regional overlords subdivided morseled out provinces to lesser feudal warlords by the score. Warlord armies came in all shapes and weaponries, as colorful as such grotesque commanders as giant Zhang Sung Zhang of legendary sexual appetite. Yen Si Shan, the treacherous drug addict. Wu Pei Fu, lover of flowers and gardens. They never thought if it rained, they thought it was foolish uh, to go out in the rain and fight. So if it was a rainy day, you were quite safe and comfortable. And then, of course, they all usually began at a certain time. They seldom began before 10 o'clock after everybody got his good breakfast and all that. They always took off for lunch. And then uh, by sunset, doesn't matter how hot the battle had been, when the sun set, everything stopped and quieted down for the night so you could get a good night's sleep and be ready to fight the next day. China watched such troops in shame, craving order, knowing sorrow. Overlord in Manchuria was Zhang Zolin. Beginning life a common bandit, this scheming marshal had learned to mock all Chinese law, flout all patriotic need. Bribed by Japanese industrialists, protected by their garrisons, his soldiers let the Japanese aliens exploit this northern treasure land at will. Even the best of warlords, Feng Yuxiang, the Christian general who baptized soldiers with a fire hose, insisting cleanliness is next to godliness, groped in vain to find a spark to unify his nation. In every valley, town, and village, men trembled at the sight of warlord soldiers. Death came by twitch of trigger, in gusts of senseless cruelty. And life became so cheap that death itself became a spectacle. Children, growing up, became inured to violence, a culture of scholars transformed by killing. In flight from warlords, drought, and taxes, from loot and rapine, refugees knew that only in the colonies and concessions of hated foreigners could they seek safety. Here, beggars for their bread, they might find mercy. A former State Department officer, Ernest Price, remembers China in the mid-twenties. We hit the uh, country at a time of terrific heat wave and at the same time drought in the Great Valleys. As our train pulled through this area, little boys at the stations would come out pot-bellied, uh, spindle-legged, and holding out their hands and saying, Da Lao Ye, Da Lao Ye, please, Master, please. We were horrified. Uh, we'd never seen anything like it. And one of our uh, legation officials said, now, boys, I want to tell you something. Don't let this get under your skin, this sort of thing. You're going to see a lot more of it in China. In the western enclaves of the coast, life for foreigners went on unchanged. Here, the skyline walled from passing tourists the site of Chinese anguish, while permanent expatriates returned each afternoon to homes of splendor, where countless servants made for master and his missy lady a sunlit way of life old China hands still mourn. From Shanghai, foreigners controlled most Chinese industries, mines, mills, and railways. They set her tariffs, collected taxes. Prosperity rested as it always had on foreign guns and gunboats, within whose shelter Western pleasures undisturbed rolled on. At race courses and at resorts, Chinese appeared, as always, servants only. At Western clubs, the tinkle of ice in cocktails rose above the muffled sound of warlord guns outside. Yet even in Shanghai, if one listened, one could hear another note. In the streets, students were calling for revolt, middle-class youngsters, yet their message caught the ear of workers, too. By 1925, 
A ferment unsettled every major city. Symbol of all protest was Sun Yat-sen, who called on China to slay the dragon of imperialism. Slowly, through the early 1920s, Sun Yat-sen had somehow built a government, won a tiny southern foothold at Canton, ringed by hostile warlords. By 1924, the aging revolutionary had learned ideas and guns must go together. Ideas he hammered into three principles called San Min Jui. First nationalism, next democracy, then socialism. To his nationalist party, the Kuomintang, he now insists to conquer China, they must fight to throw the warlords and imperialists out. They will get guns, for he has found them. Spurned by the West, in 1923, he tells the New York Times, we have lost hope of help from America, England, France. The only country that shows any sign of helping us in the South is the Soviet government of Russia. Flatly, this report concludes, the prevailing foreign estimate of Dr. Sun has been that he is a dreamer and therefore dangerous. Arch symbol of Russian help is Michael Borodin, veteran agent of the Comintern, who brings the guidance of the Bolsheviks to Sun's dreaming. Counseling, scheming, urging, the mentor communist becomes an all-pervasive influence, induces Sun Yat-sen to let the tiny Chinese Communist Party, 430 members, join Sun's nationalists. Sun gathers new-style Chinese officers to fight for country, not for loot. Of these, his favorite is Jiang Kai-shek. Sent hastily to Russia for training, Jiang soon returns, directs the Huangpo Military Academy at Canton, where patriots are trained by Russians to officer armies that will give the dream fresh muscle. Some scholars say that at this point, the Chinese leader recoiled at communism, prepared to break with Russia. But no one knows, for in March 1925, death cuts across the revolution. Sun dies of cancer. Mandarins, scholars, warlords,